then my other side of the family had the tea tents on Barracane Beach. That was my Granny Parker and mother worked there when she was a small girl. Had to walk all the way over to Woolacombe to get water because there was no water and there was literally no Woolacombe at that time. Woolacombe was built a lot later. And the pub in the village here, the old pub, the Barracane Inn, uh, that was the only pub in the village at the time. But it was called the Barracane Inn because it's the nearest people could come to get to Barracane Beach. They come on the railway, come to the station, then come down into the village, and uh, they'd sit at Barracane Inn, and then they would get probably a land or something like that down to Barracane Beach. So... The tea tents, there was, a couple, there was a couple of tea tents, Granny Parker had one, uh, a lady called Mrs Smith had another one, and if you go down on the beach now, if you know where to look in the corner, you can see where the rock had been dug away, and we used to put iron bars across, to hang the kettles on for boiling the water. <laughs> and also a big draw for barricade, you can find cowrie shells. You can find lots of Mediterranean shells coming into the beach. I think that's probably was what the attraction was for the Victorians. Um, just, I think, just as the war was starting, there was a little cliff fall just behind the, where the tea tents are, and there was a Bronze Age burial discovered there. That's incredible. So that was, uh, so that was that was very interesting. Margaret and I, Margaret Reed and I, we Margaret is really the the power behind it. Done a book called Morton and Willow on the record, right. and I helped Margaret with the research. So we, so that was the thing that turned up with that. And that was very interesting. The um, donkeys on the beach. That was my my mother's uncle, Tom Parker. He ran the donkey. He ran the donkeys on the beach, and I think a bloke called Pace Oval run the run run the bathing machines. They were they were, they were all characters. I remember. I just remember um, Tom Ammers, who was uh, mother's uncle, who ran the donkeys on the beach. Uh, that was quite interesting. So how did they work? How did, where were they stored when they were? Oh, they pulled them up, pulled them up behind, above high water. Right. Yeah. The old, the, <laughs> there's an old saying that, uh, of course, if somebody was taking a bit too long in the bathing machine, they would just yip the horse up and they'd slip them <laughs> out the back a bit quick. <laughs> Come on, sir! Don't spend too long in there. <laughs> yeah, it was, that was really good. Then we had the lifeboat in Willowcombe as well, but trouble was launching. In the rough, normally it's onshore wind, southwesterly, launched with horses, and trying, trying to get it. I think it was called the Jacka Jack, right. the, the Willacombe boat. I know one of the Ashfords were a member of the crew, as we got everywhere, but then it was, it was just rowing, and I, but I think in the end it was, it was just too rough, right. and they, they, couldn't, they couldn't get to sea. It, it was a pretty tight community. Yeah, even when I, I, well, in, when I was a kid, after Barstow Fair, you wouldn't expect to see a stranger in this village, because Morto, you don't go through Morto to go anywhere else. You have to drive out to here. So if anybody was seen walking in the village, I mean, hey, who's that? What's he doing here? What are they up to? You know, it was it was like that in the winter. You wouldn't expect to see anybody, just the locals. And that was, so imagine what it's like in Mother's time. It's in 1907. It was pretty, it was pretty grim. But as I say, people were poor as poor. But people were poor everywhere. But we had the lucky, had the shellfish. They lived lobsters, crabs, really, and limpets. You ever tried the limpet? Yeah, limpet. Well, I used to go fishing with my Uncle George. And my job as a small boy, well, 14, maybe a bit less, was to scourge around the rocks and find a tin that was just washed in. Get a tin, cut it up with me with me untinned knife, and then get some salt water. Get a fire lit, get salt water, get winkles, put the winkles in the tin, boil them up, and then he showed me the knack. You could tap them like that, and you need a pin. They fly out without a pin. That was all very good. Sad was if I couldn't find a tin. I know we'd be having bloody limpets. <laughs> so Uncle would make the fire, and then when it got down to just the glowing ashes. I'd have to go and knock off the biggest limpets we could find. Then we used to turn them upside down and put them in the ash in the red hot embers and cook them in the shells. Mind you, this bloody tough like work. <laughs> so I always always hoped that there would be a tin. I like winkles, but I wasn't so keen on the limpets. They were a bit tough. 
So that was always, Nephi would say to me, Nephi, go and see if you can find a ten. And I thought, oh, let's hope I can find this too. But if not, it would be, oh, well, limpets then, my boy. So I'll be knocking off limpets. But we, we've done very well with them. It was, uh, well, but all those, every one of us learnt the sea craft. Sundays, if mother and father were, my mother and father were busy, somebody, we got in on the beach at Grunter, boys and girls, and people with us. The girls would be in charge of tea. The boys would be in charge of getting firewood to make a fire because there's a, a fresh water stream in it at Grunter to fill the kettles to make the boil, boil the water for the tea. And then, then we all learned to, there's a pond called Pig's Bit. And everybody learned to swim in Pig's Bit. So, but we all learned about neap tides, spring tides, ground seas, rips. We all understood everything there was to know from a very early age. And that's why local boys don't get drowned. Because we understood it all. So then it, we put a little bit of wood in the, a little bit of sprig of wood in the kettle. And then the tea don't taste smoky. Don't ask me why. Engineer or another mm. mechanic, really. Was that in Ilfracombe or back in... In Woolacombe. Back in Woolacombe, yeah. In Woolacombe, in Morto, we had one, two, three, four, five garages in 1946. Goodness me, that's quite a lot. It's quite early on in the automobile trade, isn't cars it? Cars weren't like they were today. Yeah. Cars broke down every five minutes. <laughs> I suppose, yeah, fewer cars but more breakdowns. <laughs> <laughs> if you were going to Plymouth, mm. you would find somebody else with a Morris 8 same size wheels, you'd borrow their spare wheels, mm. you would take jack, puncher outfits, tire levers, mm. and you'd depend on getting four or five punchers on the way down to Plymouth and back. Wow, I guess the road quality was fairly poor back well, then and as the well. The tires so. were shocking and uh, there were no laws and regulations on them and great splits in the side, you'd put a yeah. stick of gator in the side of it and <laughs> <laughs> fill out the hole and uh, mm. drive on, you. Yes. Wow. And when you were a, a teenager or a, uh, or a child growing up on the on the coast, were you already drawn to and interested in the in the coastline and in, in the in the ocean and the water? Just kind of thinking um, about. Uh, the father died. He was a keen fisherman. He died fishing on the rocks, actually. But uh, my uncles on the mother's side, they were keen on crabbing and lobstering, which I still do today. Mm-hmm. Um, Whereabouts around here? Do you, do you do that around here, the well, crabbing? Yeah, Moore Point. Yes, oh, Moore Point, yeah. I've got my own run there. And I'm still doing that today, or, or through this summer. Hmm. And uh, and that, and collecting driftwood and climbing hmm. over the rocks. The playground was Barricane, Coombsgate and Grunto, really. Yeah, and, and did you have a group of friends that you went with? Uh, very, very or? little in that area. This, mm -hmm. uh, I had no children my age outside of Woolacombe, really. Hmm. So I had to go to Woolacombe. That was, what, three quarters of a mile, or half a mile to walk into Woolacombe. Yeah. In, next door there was nobody, so I had no friends there. So I had a bit of a loner in a way. Hmm. But roaming the beaches, looking at the beaches, drifters, climbing the rocks. So many stories. Were there particular areas that you favoured for Well, to start things? with, we were diving off the shore mm -hmm. and put our gear on on the beach and swim out into the water. Mm. And the first dive for the club, I actually wasn't on it. And why they went there, I don't know, but they went down a cliff at Brandy Cove mm. uh, on the other side of Hillsborough there, mm. got onto the beach, and uh, they all went diving off the beach. They all ran out of air. They all had a struggle to get back onto the beach again, and they learned quite a few lessons from that. <laughs> <I bet. laughs> we did our training in the salt water pool on Ilfracombe here, which was indoor but using salt water and, and mm. it was wonderful form. Mm. And uh, that went on till 1968, something mm. like that. Is that a man-made pool? Or it was a man-made pool okay, so for real natural. swimming, you know, scare okay. with diving okay. boards and oh, changing okay. rooms indoors, but it was salt water. salt water. Was that siphoned in from the sea? Siphoned then? in from oh, the sea okay. and, and changed and... Yeah. I don't know whether they changed it quite often. They <laughs> had it running through. Perhaps they had mm. it running through continually, you know, okay. with a pump and, yeah. and yeah. just draining back and yeah. draining in one end. I've never heard of that before, salt yeah. water. Yeah. Pool. And anyways, that was fine, yeah. but they closed that down. And uh, we then 
Roy had built the Maricot and built mm. a swimming pool in it, so we mm. used the Maricot for many years after that. Okay. 